Good morning or afternoon, everyone. It's one o'clock. We're going to wait a couple of minutes before we get started so that everybody who's planning to join can join. Good afternoon again to those of you who've joined. Uh, we're going to wait just another minute or so before we start. We still have quite a few people signing in. So good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today. And welcome to VEIC's first clean energy call, the Pandemic New Normal for Energy Efficiency Programs. My name is Carol Weston, and I'll be your moderator today. I currently serve as the Director of Operations for Efficiency Vermont, which is Vermont's statewide energy efficiency utility administered by VEIC. My work includes managing Efficiency Vermont's portfolio of programs and services, and so I'm very excited to hear from today's panelists about the new normal for energy efficiency in the current COVID and hopefully soon post-COVID world. So a little background on VEIC. We are a sustainable energy company on a mission to generate the energy solutions the world needs. For over 30 years, VEIC has been working with governments, utilities, foundations, and businesses across North America to develop and deploy clean energy services that provide immediate and lasting change. Our role is both implementers of energy efficiency programs and as consultants to states and other EEUs throughout the country gives us a direct view into the impact COVID has and will continue to have on our clean energy work. So with our clean energy call series, we really wanted to lean into the questions that so many of us are grappling with right now. And during each of our calls, we will hear from energy experts across the country to unpack the new set of obstacles and opportunities we are facing and spotlight smart strategies that move us forward. Today's topic is complex and ever-changing. What is the new normal for energy efficiency programs? Where does energy efficiency fit in to what society is currently grappling with? And how can energy efficiency help us all get back on our feet? We wanna dig into the question of whether customers can afford to care anymore about energy efficiency and ultimately whether they can afford not to care. So with that, I'm gonna introduce today's panelists. So first, I'd like to welcome Becca Treach. Becca serves as an Energy Efficiency Administrator at the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. And Becca's work focuses on developing and overseeing policies and programs that seek to reduce long-term energy costs and promote the adoption of clean and no-to-low-carbon energy solutions. Welcome, Becca. 
Maybe you can give us a wave so we know exactly who you are. There you are. Thank you. Next is Mark Schoenheider. Mark serves as the manager of customer energy solutions at XL Energy. Mark leads a team responsible for residential and small business demand side management portfolios across Excel Energy territories. Excel Energy has millions of customers spread across eight Western and Midwestern states. Welcome, Mark. And Mark, maybe you can give us a wave too. There he is, thank you. Next is Charles Dickerson. Charles serves as the Deputy General Manager and Chief Operating Officer of Austin Energy. Charles leads the team that focuses on power production, electric service delivery, and strategy, and seeks to prioritize customer care as a central priority point to operations. He has been published in Intelligent Utility Magazine and Texas Renewable Energy Industries Alliance. Welcome, Charles, and thanks for that wave. <laughs> and lastly, Emily Levin. Emily serves as a managing consultant at BEIC and oversees the development of BEIC's energy programs. Emily is a trusted resource for utilities, program administrators and states looking to optimize existing programs and bring new and impactful approaches to the market. She has extensive experience on energy efficiency and energy resource policies and designing programs to support low-income and disadvantaged customers. She's also a board member of the Building Performance Association and welcome Emily. Thanks for the wave. Okay, I'm just gonna, what I'm gonna do is just remove the slide that you're all seeing so that you can see just the panelists for the rest of the discussion. And at the end, we'll have a slide with everyone's contact information. So when we scheduled this call, we really thought that we would be on the other side or at least closer to the other side of COVID-19. And unfortunately, that's not where we're at. Certainly, we uh, all on this call today um, hope that you're all weathering the current situation well and staying safe and really thank you for taking the time to join us today. So, and to share insights on how energy efficiency programs are responding to COVID, we have this wonderful panel that you just met representing a, a wide range of perspectives and various regions throughout the country. Um, different utility business uh, models, such as investor-owned utilities, municipal utilities, third-party administrators of energy efficiency, and uh, a lot of great um, perspectives to share. So thank you to our panelists as well. Our plan today is to begin by discussing the state of things. Where are we now? Uh, and then move to how energy efficiency programs have evolved to meet changing needs. And then finally, looking ahead, where do we go from here? And as we go through the topics today, we'll be weaving in the themes of the questions that we received from those of you that submitted questions in advance. So without further ado, I'd like to move us right into our first topic. So to set us up, you know, here in the US today, we've got pretty high case numbers, uh, a stressed healthcare system, families that are in a bit of upheaval as they try to manage working from home, going back to work, the possibility of remote uh, learning, fully or partial for their children, and just unemployment being something that's at the front of folks' minds. And so really a lot of changes for people, right? And in response to those abrupt changes for our customers, as well as the economy and job status, uh, many of energy efficiency programs are really faced with the option of evolving or becoming somewhat irrelevant at this point in time. As the priorities of our customers and clients have changed in many parts of the country, it's simply not an option to do business as usual. Uh, so to our panelists, let's begin. And I'm gonna uh, begin this question with Mark and, and then each of you will have a chance to answer. How have your customers and trade allies been affected by COVID so far? And how have you evolved your energy efficiency programs and services in response? Wow, nothing like starting off with an easy question. <laughs> no, um, you know, we've seen a pretty diverse kind of impacts across our, our service territories. Um, but if I start with the first one of, of impacts to customers, um, and I'll break it out into sort of our res and small business versus our, our commercial and industrial, um, we've seen kind of a tale of two, two different customer classes. They're really on the, the business side. Um, starting in, in March and April, we saw pretty significant decreases in usage and, you know, in the 5-15% the, the range, 
Um, and those have started to come back. They're, they're headed in the right direction, but we're still overall usage is, is lower um, on the business side. On the residential side, we saw an initial, uh, when, you know, kind of March, April, cooler weather, um, we saw a initial increase, you know, maybe three to 4%, um, and that has started to trend up um, even on a, a weather adjusted basis as it's gotten warmer and warmer customer uh, residential customer uses has continued to go up um, overall that that kind of leaves us uh, lower uh, from an overall usage standpoint um, because the you know those increases in residential have not offset the the decreases on the business side um, as far as our our trade partners you know in our in in our efficiency business, um, they've been hit hard too, right? There have been furloughs, there have been layoffs. Um, a lot of the work they do is very customer interactive and very intensive. And so, you know, we've tried to, to adapt our programs and shift them not only to help those customers, especially those residential customers that are seeing higher bills, um, but also to, to keep the trade healthy, right? We, we know we're going to come out of this at some point. We need uh, as part of that recovery and, and to be able to bounce back, we need our trade partners and our contractors to be strong, you know, in a good position. Um, and so some of the, the changes we made to our programs, um, you know, include things like taking some of them that, that used to be a contact um, experience, like our refrigerator recycling programs, and make that totally non-contact, right? And and you know making it so that a customer can can leave that appliance um, either in the garage or outside and have a, a totally non-contact uh, experience to pick that up um, and you know we've done others where like our school kits um, we've transitioned that from a, a curriculum that's focused on in-person learning with the teachers there to literally shipping kits to customers' homes and updating the, the content for teachers to, to do it in a, a remote learning uh, environment. Uh, you know, we've we've added um, work from home kits, so totally free to customers. They can log on and select from various water saving devices, uh, light bulbs and whatnot to really try to help those customers that are spending more time at home um, and give them a, a lower, a no-cost way to, to help fight that uh, that higher bill. Um, we've also, on all of our audit programs, we've rolled out options to do remote audits. Um, you know, and there's some challenges there because many of our audits have historically had direct install components, and the mechanics of how that works um, just changes, right? And so, in some of our customer classes, we can still have our vendor, you know, put together that the, the DI measures into a bundle and, and ship them to customers, and then walk through and install those with customers you know, remotely over uh, various media, whether it's FaceTime or some have, some of our implementers actually have a, a developed their own interactive app where they can not only do the, the video chat, but they can also do some, you know, identification and, and uh, capturing, you know, pictures of, of equipment as it's installed, those sorts of things. Um, one of the, other segments that's been really hard hit is our, our low income customers, right? And and not only if they already were there, they're they're having a harder time, but also the, the number of customers in that segment um, has significantly increased. And so, you know, the the support that we provide at, at food banks, whether it's through giveaways of efficient equipment or financial, we've we've increased that quite a bit. Um, and we also have some some interesting programs we're looking at where you know looking at customers that have not historically struggled paying bills, but either are late or uh, haven't been able to pay, you know, directly reaching out and, and sending them some, some efficient equipment, whether it's light bulb, shower heads, those sorts of things, as well as uh, a very targeted communication to them of other things they can do, low cost, no cost. So, um, you know, the other, the other, the last thing I'll mention on kind of how we've adapted is related a little more to the logistics side around doing some remote M and B um, you know, we have a pretty rigorous m and requirements in all of our states and being able to still execute those and facilitate that without being on site to do it. Um, we've gotten pretty creative in and had some good cooperation from our regulators to allow us to, to try some of those out. And um, they've been working pretty successfully. 
Thanks, Mark. Some great on the ground um, implementation solutions. Love to hear that. Becca, let's move it over to you so you can talk a little bit about Rhode Island. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. And Mark, it is impressive how, much, how many things have, have changed. Um, I think in Rhode Island, we're actually very similar in terms of all of the different steps that have been taken. Um, I will say that some of the things are specific to COVID um, versus others, I think, are, are simply were accelerated. They were sort of long term goals that we were moving towards anyway, but um, we realized the immediate benefits of them um, related to COVID. And so we accelerated them as quickly as possible. So just to build off what Mark said, um, of course, we came up with uh, safety protocols for all of the work that, that's ongoing at this point. Rhode Island is lucky enough to have people being able to go in and out of homes at this point. That said, if there is a spike in, in some, in our cases, unclear how long that would or would not uh, last, right? We, we may have to ebb and flow um, with what is or is not possible. Um, so of course, that's very COVID specific uh, in terms of those safety protocols and the quality assurance of ensuring all of the contractors have been trained in those. Um, also providing online trainings for those contractors, again, outside of the safety protocols, but um, just all of the trainings that we normally provided. Uh, that was something that was very COVID specific and wasn't necessarily something we were uh, really focused on providing uh, immediately. Um, and then of course, we are also doing sort of the, the mail, mail in kits uh, for people uh, that, are, that are working from home. Uh, that said, the things that we really accelerated uh, that we were already planning on doing were really the virtual assessments. Uh, there were a lot of positives about those anyway that we were exploring uh, in terms of hopefully finding some cost efficiencies for uh, sort of our residential sector. Historically, we've, we've done free home energy assessments, which have been really productive, uh, but they have relied heavily on sort of lighting savings to support them. And so uh, we were already exploring virtual assessments uh, and COVID made that extremely important and necessary. So we ramped that up pretty much immediately. Um, and similarly uh, on sort of EM and V 2.0, right? Uh, we were exploring that as well. Uh, we're actually working pretty closely with multiple utilities and, and other states to figure out what kind of remote metering and um, other data sources we could use to uh, evaluate our programs. And again, hopefully a, a less costly way. Um, that was ongoing, but it got ramped up really quickly because of COVID. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We, we saw that as um, an opportunity to advance more quickly than we otherwise would have. Um, the other important things I want to note are, are just simply communications with um, income eligible customers. Again, we were actively trying to use the energy efficiency programs in Rhode Island to make sure that those customers have access to uh, payment plans and, and getting on sort of our, our income eligible rate. Um, that was obviously uh, expanded as much as possible under COVID. We want to make sure that um, those that are struggling have access to all of the services and there's extensive coordination between all of those efforts. Um, and likewise, we have been doing our best in Rhode Island to try to coordinate among states and among utilities. Um, National Grid is our largest utility within Rhode Island. They cover more than 95% of our state. Um, and they have been good enough to, of course, try to coordinate with our neighboring states and the, the neighboring utilities to try to uh, ensure that protocols that are put in place uh, really are somewhat equivalent uh, between the states, which I know is helping contractors as well. So I think that is the, the other key point I would mention is any kind of coordination among uh, entities, I think is, is ongoing and vital. Um, and hopefully we can continue to benefit if we keep up those communications. Thanks, Becca. Yeah, certainly we've all had a lot of lessons in how to communicate differently um, since we've since March, I'll just say. And, and also really appreciate the um, the nod to sort of being adaptive as some of the changes that you that we places that we may be now may move back depending on where we go with the virus so that's a really important point charles how about you um uh from austin energy's perspective how would you uh sort of describe where things are and how you're responding so thank you carol for having me here um, and to the panel members i want to start off where becca left off because i think it's important in terms of coordinating with other agencies. One of the values of this panel, as you pointed out, is that we have different perspectives. We have a municipal perspective, city government, IOU perspective. Being a public power organization, we're part of the city department, albeit we're an enterprise organization like a business. 
And so we necessarily have to coordinate with other city departments, not that we would not want to, but it's part of the construct and the fiber. Um, so there's a lot of coordination between Austin Energy, Austin Public Health, obviously the city council, which governs the city around what we can do. Uh, we have suspended disconnects for people who are gonna be having um, challenges paying. Um, but as Mark pointed out, and as Becca pointed out, there are income eligible people who may not have historically considered themselves in that area now. And we need to figure out, and we've been figuring out how do we get them to see themselves where they really are and reach out for help to call in for payment arrangements. Uh, as it relates specifically to COVID, um, we are doing some uh, remote uh, monitoring using Facebook, using technologies like we're doing now. I think FaceTime is what we're using to do remote monitoring. Uh, we're continuing to um, encourage customers to continue to try to be efficient with the energy, but at the same time, um, to make small payments that they can to keep themselves current to avail themselves of any state and city funding. From an employee perspective, we immediately, like maybe the second week of February, moved everyone who could work remotely, remotely from Austin Energy um, so that we could minimize the likelihood of people being um, infected and contaminated. Uh, I will say this, I think all of the industries and all of the different functions and institutions are important, but at the end of the day, if we don't have electricity running to hospitals and schools and fire stations and police stations, we can't empower cities and governments. So we have to have the electric going. So it's extremely important for us to keep the men and women who help make that happen as safe as possible. Uh, I think Mark will attest most utilities number one value is safety. And so we just incorporated that old umbrella of safety with respect to COVID. Um, so we're making certain that not only do we continually educate the men and women of Austin Energy, we have a lot of communications to our customers around social distancing to the extent that they can wear masks, washing their hands and things of that nature. That That's really helpful. Thank you, Charles. I mean, being embedded in the city of Austin and all of the other services that the city is providing, you have a unique um, sort of, you have unique access to, to your customers, right? Because you're, you're talking with them on a daily basis. So I really appreciate that, that you bringing that up. And um, that's a really interesting perspective. Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, talking from the BEIC perspective and, and answering that question of uh, sort of where are we and, and how have we evolved and, and how have you seen BEIC's work change? Sure. Thanks, Carol. Um, and the perspective that I'll share comes from sort of a few different angles because I do do consulting work nationally. I get to work with a number of different states. And I also have a national perspective from my work on the board of the Building Performance Association, um, which was very active in supporting energy efficiency contractors who were very hard hit and have continued to be hard hit by the pandemic. Um, and then I also have the benefit of learning from the experiences of the places where VEIC is directly implementing programs like Efficiency Vermont and the DC Sustainable Energy Utility. So I'll try to kind of bring all those perspectives to bear. So starting with the, the broader industry perspective, just a couple of notes on contractors. Um, I think we heard several of the panelists speak on how contractors were very hard hit. The energy efficiency sector overall lost more than 400,000 jobs in the spring. Um, it did start to rebound slightly in June and July, but it's sort of unclear if that trend is gonna go back in the wrong direction. Um, and the impacts that we saw um, with the Building Performance Association on contractors really varied a lot state by state. Um, in some states, energy efficiency was kind of categorized with construction or HVAC as essential work, whereas in other states it was not and programs were totally shut down. Um, and so we've seen really varied impacts state by state depending on how each state handled that, but we did see a lot of states taking the steps that, that Becca and Mark mentioned and Charles to support contractors and a big focus on virtual trainings to keep contractors productive. Um, <clears throat> lately, as things have started to open back up, although now they might be shutting down again, there's also been a major focus on safe return to work and safety protocols. So I just wanted to note, if you haven't seen it, the Building Performance Association has a back to work, kind of safe return to work, um, resource page with a lot of very valuable resources on kind of cleaning procedures, ventilation procedures, you know, mask wearing, and, and everybody is dealing with that and being very thoughtful about that. In terms of Efficiency Vermont's direct experience with customers, 
Um, a lot of it echoes what we've already heard from other panelists, so I thought I'd kind of touch on a few, few other angles um, that, that Vermont experienced. Um, so one was sort of the overarching goals for Efficiency Vermont's response. So Efficiency Vermont set some core um, objectives around its, its response to COVID and really carried that through everything it has done since. So those were to meet the needs of Vermonters where they're at, so staying, staying safe, saving money, keeping businesses operating, to engage appropriately for the moment. So for example, Efficiency Vermont paused its active product promotion in March and April during kind of the active shutdown in Vermont. It, it, you know, we didn't want to be tone deaf. <laughs> we wanted to kind of meet people where they were at. Um, ensuring that the programs were accessible and providing relief to all simplifying participation and then partnering for solutions. So those were sort of core principles around Vermont's response that shaped everything else um, that Efficiency Vermont did. So in terms of engaging appropriately, there was initially a huge drop in engagement, a 70% decline in early April, which was our peak kind of um, shutdown in Vermont, a decline in engagement with the customer support team, a 40% decline in website users. But it's been interesting now, you know, with everybody kind of stuck at home and maybe having more time and spending more time on online, that has really rebounded. And now um, the website has actually seen um, a 23% in website users comparing Q2 of 2020 to, to last year. So we've actually been able to build back um, engagement through Efficiency Vermont. And they've been done it by they've done that by being very relevant. Um, in the, the way they're engaging with customers, again, to meet them where they're at and doing things like Facebook watch parties around energy efficiency tips and um, activities for kids. They actually did a seed starting post so Vermonters are big into gardening and that turned out to be the most popular post that Efficiency Vermont ever did. So a lot of inbound marketing to try to bring people to the website and kind of meet them at um, where they're at as they engaged from home. So some similar strategies with things like curbside appliance recycling and virtual um, home and business energy visits or assessments, um, but some other areas that, that I haven't heard mentioned that may be of interest. Um, Efficiency Vermont um, has had a big focus on encouraging weatherization through some do-it-yourself offers that are available at retail and then enhanced incentives, including for low and moderate income Vermonters. And there's some messaging there, like try to weatherize now over the summer while you can to make your house comfortable in case you're stuck at home again in our long Vermont winter. So, you know, there's a little bit of a, a message there. Um, enhanced financing offers to increase lift and efficiency rise doing things like covering the first six months of payment um, and trying to do that in a way that's really simple and accessible. Um, and then there's also been an interesting focus on health. Um, both residential and in the CNI sector. So um, on the residential side, doing things like new appliance rebate offers for products focused on health and safety, like dehumidifiers and air purifiers and air conditioners. And on the um, commercial and institutional and industrial side, um, Efficiency Vermont is actually doing this really interesting program right now around school indoor air quality, using some of the state's um, CARES kind of recovery funding to support K through 12 schools, um, improve their, their HVAC and ventilation systems and do things like install MERV 13 filters and increase air changes per hour and just really focus on ventilation and, and hone in on that. Um, CNI strategies with commercial and industrial customers, Efficiency Vermont has also been prioritizing low and no cost measures like tuning and setbacks for buildings that were vacated like colleges and universities in the spring. Um, and then we're actually currently working with NYSERDA on a, a program to do virtual treasure hunts, um, which are a way to engage commercial and industrial um, customers in finding significant kind of low, no cost savings through treasure hunts. So it's kind of focused on operational improvements, things you can turn off or retune, um, and by engaging with, with employees to find those um, at industrial facilities and um, we found that virtual treasure hunts can identify savings of around 10% across the facility, and we're currently kind of experimenting. We used to do that in person, now we're trying to do that um, virtually. So those are some of the kind of um, interesting ways that Efficiency Vermont and VEIC um, have pivoted. 
Thanks, Emily. It's great to hear the the sort of full suite of things, and and you all did a great job of of, of talking broadly, um, making connections, and also having some things indiv individualized to your area that are really interesting. Um, so having heard from all of our panelists about how customers and trade allies have been affected and, and some of the tactics used to provide relief, let's broaden the lens a bit for a few moments. And uh, with everything going on, we know that it's extremely important to lower financial burden on our customers while driving smart economic stimulus, creating jobs, and meeting these aggressive climate goals, which are not going away and certainly are, are no less of, a, of an issue. So, and we must also admit, of course, that without support from stakeholders and policymakers, our efforts may really struggle to gain traction. And so with that um, in mind, I just wanna ask our panelists to consider, um, and, and I'll start with you, Charles, how has COVID affected the policy and regulatory outlook, if at all, um, for energy efficiency in your area? And what do you see as the outlook for efficiency going forward as the pandemic continues? So, uh we have not seen a impact to policy with respect to energy efficiency vis-a-vis -vis COVID. And I think part of the reason for that is, is prior to COVID and just prior to COVID hitting, Austin Energy had completed a generation uh, and environmental resource plan uh, that we're mandated to complete. Uh, and it was a stakeholder process. It was not Austin Energy's plan. It's a stakeholder city plan with various groups from um, um, various industrial customers, residential customers, low-income customers, environmental groups, uh, different, um, uh, should I say, uh, diversity dimension groups like His Hispanic Chambers of Commerce or Asian Chambers of Commerce, African American Chambers of Commerce. So it was a very inclusive public process that we completed that uh, environmental plan and Reese Generation Resource Plan, which basically necessitates that we're going to be completely carbon-free by the year 2035. Um, and it also necessitated that we have a clear and measurable ramp down of our carbon sources because we own generation generating facilities, carbon-based and um, renewables. Part of that plan also um, contemplated what are we going to do to increase our energy efficiency goals. And there's going to be a we've committed to a 33% increase in energy efficiency and demand response between 2020 uh, and 2035. So um, that's significant and we're well on the way to getting that done and standing up programs. So we haven't seen a reversal vis-a-vis -vis COVID from any of our stakeholders or any of our customer groups saying, well, we want to not do these things anymore because of COVID. We haven't also not seen uh, um, an increased demand, I think because it's still fresh because we haven't had to modify anything and we're still having the programs run and, and moving along. Uh, that's one of, been one of the benefits. One of the other benefits, and again, this is part of being public power, um, a lot of the energy efficiency that we realize in the city of Austin is inherent in our building codes. So we have extremely stringent codes, um, criteria and building codes with respect to efficiency for windows, for glass, for lighting, for insulation. And those codes are informed by a collaborative process between the codes department, the utility, and other interested groups. Meaning, so if you're gonna build anything in Austin Energy, it has some inherent requirements around energy efficiency uh, above and beyond what we would use the utility. And those things are going just well for right now. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm not a superstitious person, not going mm -hmm. whatever my best is made out of. We have not seen any pushback vis-a-vis um, -vis COVID. Yeah, so sort of steady as she goes and maybe even continuing to accelerate the goals uh, from, from Charles' perspective. Becca, how about you? What have you, what have you been experiencing? Yeah, no, I, um, it is a little bit different, I think, in, in some New England states at this point. Um, I, I think I can say my office has been highly supportive and will continue to be supportive of uh, maintaining and growing our energy efficiency programs as much as possible because ultimately we are dependent on these efficiency programs to achieve really aggressive goals to meet our climate change goals for the state. Um, and we all, I think we all recognize that. That said, there have been stakeholders within New England um, that have been concerned about the cost of energy efficiency programs and have um, advocated for suspending uh, collections for those programs. Uh, I think Rhode Island has been very lucky that um, majority of stakeholders really recognize the value of these programs and the long-term benefits um, and so we we don't see uh, a pause happening but i i will be very clear and blunt that that people have 
uh, advocated in, in opposition. Um, that said, again, we will continue to be as aggressive as possible. We will, of course, have to balance uh, near-term costs versus long-term savings. Uh, we do recognize that um, bill impacts are particularly difficult right now um, and may be difficult in the future if, if the economy doesn't turn, turn around. And so um, we will luckily be able to take that on a year-by-year -year basis within Rhode Island. Our energy efficiency programs do get approved on an annual basis. And so we plan on really balancing those um, concerns and, and impacts uh, on that annual uh, increment. That said, I do also want to make the point, though, that there, there does seem to be a bit of a misconception um, among some stakeholders that energy efficiency should be deprioritized right now um, because we should be focusing on, on public safety and, and COVID response. Uh, I just want to be very clear that, that I think we can do both at the same time, um, I, especially around sort of ventilation or HVAC concerns. I think Emily spoke to this a little bit. Um, there are a lot of buildings, such as schools right now, that are looking to increase their ventilation systems, um, make sure that we have more outside air coming in. Um, we can do that in the most cost efficient and, and energy efficient way um, by working with the energy efficiency programs. And even if right now we need to be pulling in more outside air to make spaces safer, I'm hoping, and I'm very much an optimist, <laughs> that in the future we won't have to do that. And so we should be putting systems in place that are able to ramp down and be cost efficient in the future for everybody so that we're then not stuck with um, sort of negative consequences long term. So I do want to say that I, I view energy efficiency programs as, as vital to our um, economic recovery and our health and safety. And so I, I view them as, as being uh, absolutely necessary. And I, I hope that they remain as strong as they have been within the New England states. Well said. Thank you very much, Becca. Mark? Let's move over to you, sort of in your territory. How has uh, how are stakeholders, policymakers? What's the outlook there, and 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 is it changing? Yeah, you know, I'm going to build a little bit on what Charles said. Um, Excel Energy was 18 months ago. We were the first IOU to publicly put out a a broad carbon goal. Um, which is an 80% carbon reduction on our electric system by 2030 and 100% carbon free by 2050. Um, and along with that, the, the, the requirements of getting there, which are, are fundamental to who we are, is that we have to keep customer bills low. And, you know, there, there's always pressure and every once in a while people see the, the DSM rider on bills. Um, the, the great story that we have to tell them, though, is we've been doing DSM very successfully. And between that and adding renewables, adding the right renewables in the right places, um, we've actually kept our, our customer bills not only flat, but average over the last five years, they've gone down. And that is, um, that's a huge kind of feather in the cap when different groups come in and say, oh, energy efficiency, it's too expensive. It's like, no, it's it's really not. It's in the near term and in the long term, it's keeping bills down. Um, so we've been very you know, fortunate to have that track record and to be able to leverage that to kind of dispel the, the naysayers. Um, we did, you know, not specifically due to COVID, but we did have our, our DSM plans come up, their multi-year plans in our two largest jurisdictions this year. We filed them both July 1st. Um, and and they grew right. The the amount of DSM uh, grew significantly. The spend grew a little bit, um, and those are under review right now. So, but we are we're getting positive feedback from from parties. So I don't anticipate a, a decline in energy efficiency. Um, you know, in those states, um, you know, and and we'll see how those those cases work out. Um, I will say an interesting. Uh, a related topic is in in Minnesota. Actually, the the legislature came together and came to us to try to understand, you know, what can we put together not only to to help, help customers save energy, but really to stimulate the economy and, and what can we do? Um, and we were happy to partner with uh, some other groups and put together a a plan that that is uh, under review right now that not only enhances energy efficiency 
you know, but it also accelerates some of our, our solar investments and accelerates some of our, uh, our wind repowering to really get, you know, dollars flowing, beneficial dollars flowing in the, in the state. Um, added into that, we have some interesting uh, additions and, and guidance to really look and see how we can use DSM to not only enhance training and, you know, certification for existing companies, but also workforce development, right? Give skills to people that may have been negatively impacted and may be out of work, you know, use it as an opportunity to retrain and, you know, to, to honestly benefit the, the DSM industry, right? The energy efficiency industry to kind of continue that cycle of, of building and investing the dollars, not only for the near-term benefit for customers, but also, you know, to build that, that whole, uh, whole set of logistics and that whole machine to, to keep the thing going. So um, I don't see, you know, to go back to Charles, knock on whatever this desk is made out of. Um, I don't see a, 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 a negative impact. And I think part of that is based on the success we've experienced and the results we've demonstrated of, of using energy efficiency to keep bills low and to actually reduce them over the last few years. So. Thank you, Mark. We're all knocking on our, our newly acquired home desks, right? Which maybe two months ago were the dining room table or maybe still are. Uh, Emily, I'm gonna pass it off to you to sort of wrap up this topic before we move on to our next one. Yeah, just building on what, what the other panelists shared, I would say that a key strategy we've seen um, and we've used in the programs we operate as well as the the partners we have in other states, um, strategies to maintain support for energy efficiency despite some of these concerns around kind of immediate um, rate impacts, the need for rate relief. Um, one of the key things we found is, is making sure the services are really directly relevant and meeting people where they're at. So using some of the strategies, the, those principles that I shared, previously to make sure that the services are really relevant um, and doing things like helping people address indoor air quality and make their homes more safe and comfortable. Um, and just making sure that we're not perceived as out of touch, but we're really providing um, directly useful solutions. So that's been a real, a really key sort of tactic for maintaining <laughs> stakeholder support for energy efficiency in addition to having that track record of long-term um, value and savings like Mark laid out. Um, and then shifting to kind of a broader perspective, it's been interesting to hear that all three of um, the places where the, the other panelists represent have kind of stayed the course and maintained committed commitments to energy efficiency. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing as a broader trend that states and utilities that have strong clean energy and climate goals are, are staying the course or even expanding programs, which is great to see. And so we're seeing that in places like New York, um, even you know we're currently working in New Hampshire and they're still planning to expand their energy efficiency programs um, somewhat. And, and really make energy efficiency part of a, an economic stimulus and a job creation engine and kind of continue that course towards clean energy. Um, I think it is different in states that have um, less mature programs and perhaps not as strong or longstanding a commitment to clean energy goals. So the places we've seen some retrenchment, I mean, we have seen energy programs suspended in some states. Um, in the Midwest and you know, they're generally states or utilities that, that don't have that long-term commitment or those long-term clean energy goals. So I do worry a bit that, that COVID as in so many other ways in this area could exacerbate inequalities and inequities and disparities in sort of how different states and regions are um, responding and um, either supporting or, or pulling back on energy efficiency. I think the longer term outlook does just depend quite a bit on the, the national perspective. And, you know, I think we're all aware of the election <laughs> um, in a few months, fast approaching. And I do want folks to be aware that there are a number of energy efficiency kind of proposals that are circulating um, in, in Congress as part of different infrastructure and stimulus proposals. And at this point, it's looking like any of those are, are gonna wait until after the election. So this election is gonna have a, a quite a, a strong impact on the type of response we see from the national 
government and um, if we have a, a, an administration that's supportive of clean energy, there could be a number of energy efficiency um, proposals and you know state aid funding proposals that could really benefit our sector. Things like Hope for Homes, which would provide um, rebates for home retrofits is, is one such bill um, among many others. So, so that's a huge uncertainty kind of on the horizon that we'll need to wait you know, a few months to see how that plays out. Thank you. Yeah. So climate energy goals uh, aren't going anywhere for sure. And there's a lot of synergy between COVID relief programming and traditional EE solutions in many ways. And, and the, um, the audience doesn't change, right? So thank you all for that. Really good discussion. Charles, you have your hand up. Yeah, if I could, for just 30 seconds, I wanted to tie okay. some dots together um, with respect yep. to energy efficiency, particularly in the organized markets of the country uh, for the audience. And by organized, I mean those areas that have what we call um, independent system operators, ISO New England, ISO New York, PJM, MISO, ERCOT in Texas. Um, for the vast majority of electric use customers in the country, the biggest part of their bill was the supply piece. And a lot of times the supply piece is predicated on the cost of what we call the marginal unit, which is traditionally the most inefficient unit. So they stack units based on efficiency of cost. And as more and more load comes up and more and more people use electricity, we have to add more and more inefficient units to the generation mix, which means the cost of energy goes up. So that's another reason why energy efficiency is very important, because to the extent that we can shave peaks and minimize the overall amount of energy that anyone, any group of people are using in a region, then less efficient power plants don't have to run. They're not as expensive. Um, you're contributing not only to the, the, the cost benefit of the region, but you're also contributing to the environmental benefit of the region. So even if you don't have an environmental play, even if you did not have that, from a financial perspective, energy efficiency is very important because it minimizes the need to run cost inefficient power plants. Yeah, so it's a resource, right? In all cases, a resource. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Great, so uh, as we turn our attention towards the last part of our time together, I really wanna think about where we go from here and hear the panelists' thoughts on that. As we heard, there's lots of uncertainty out there. You know, how, how will the pandemic progress and what will be the long-term strategy for rebuild? How is the federal government going to respond? You know, we know that revenue um, revenues are down uh, due to lower sales. Um, arrearages are up in areas due to customers having trouble paying bills. You know, thinking about the appetite long-term for uh, EE programs and solutions, um, but also really just understanding the risk and uncertainty out there and, and how as leaders, we can aggressively and proactively come up with solutions that we can implement and they may not all stick, but really surface them and make them more relevant. So, um, you know, what can we hold on to? What have we learned? What can we stick with? Um, and how do health and accessibility become part of the new normal? So to our panelists, um, the question is, you know, looking ahead, what does the new normal for energy efficiency look like? Uh, what program changes have you made that you think will stick? Um, and what additional impacts do you an anticipate uh, seeing from here? And Becca, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think there are sort of maybe four points that I really wanna make here um, in, in terms of moving forward and, and what we expect from our energy efficiency programs. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about their uh, the potential for energy efficiency programs to really work as economic stimulus and to support local workforce development. I think that that link is not going to go away. Um, at this point, we are uh, strongly making the case that uh, energy efficiency programs employ hundreds, if not thousands, of people in, in states, and they keep uh, dollars circulating locally. I think that will continue to be a large synergy that we continue to rely on the energy efficiency programs to provide. Um, so that's one positive change. Um, in addition to that, I would say that virtual assessments um, are not going away. Again, that was something we were already aiming towards, but on a broader scale, I would say that it's not just virtual assessments, it's ultimately trying to leverage new technologies as quickly as possible to make things as cost efficient as possible. Um, I think that is something that we have discovered through COVID that can be successful um, and we can do things more quickly than I think we ever thought we could. Um, of course, we always want to try to do things as 
pro proactively and um, uh, thoughtfully as possible for our customers. But uh, that said, I think we we have historically been somewhat hesitant to take uh, large leaps of change with our with our programs. Um, we tend to go through a small pilot process and then um, expand out slowly over time. I think this has showcased that we can have more flexibility within the programs, and so I view that as again a, a step in the right direction. Um, likewise, our third point is really around long-term customer engagement. Um, I think we were moving in this direction anyway. Again, uh, historically, some of these programs have been a little bit one touch where uh, you've had an energy assessment, you install some some measures one time and, and the customer feels like they're they're done, right? They've, they've checked the box, they're, they're now an efficient customer. Um, but we now know that technology keeps changing, uh, buildings have long lives, things, things fail, um, things need to be upgraded and changed. I think the energy efficiency programs at this point uh, are moving in a direction where long-term customer engagement is going to be the new norm. Um, and that's extremely important now because of COVID uh, and the economic downturn, right? Um, unfortunately, some people are not able to move forward with their energy efficiency improvements right now. But as long as that relationship is maintained, maybe in a year, two years from now, all of this work can be done. And so that's sort of the third point I wanted to make. And lastly, um, I really wanted to drive home the point that COVID and, and many other uh, uh, political uh, campaigns right now have, have driven home the fact that our, our country is unequal, unfortunately. Um, there is substantial inequity. And I think all of those concerns have made their way into our energy efficiency programs and are here to stay. I think that we will see a long-term commitment from the efficiency programs to make sure that we are tracking um, how we are serving people in terms of energy burdens, uh, whether those people have uh, different issues regarding a renter or a landlord situation. I think there's gonna be a long-term effort there to make sure that equity is, is proactively considered. Um, so those are the four big changes that I see that hopefully will we'll stick around. Those are great changes to note. And thanks for doing that, Becca. Really appreciate it. Mark, over to you, same question. I think you might be on mute or unless it's just me that's not hearing you sorry <laughs> no i was on mute gotcha we hear you now i'm just surprised that that was the first time today so i would agree with everything becca was saying um that what i would add is really for us i think the the choices we offer customers are going to be key right and, and offering them more choices right before it was either in person and then during COVID, it was on, you know, a, an online assessment, for example, or a, a virtual audit. Um, there's no reason we can't do both. And long term, some customers are going to opt for one, some customers are going to opt for the other. So, um, you know, offering kind of that menu and, and giving more customers choices to, to participate will stick around. Um, the other, another interesting and um, very, very good thing that came out of this is really the, the working relationships with our stakeholders um, by necessity have gotten so much better and so much faster. Um, we were able to, within a couple months, really transform some of our programs and we couldn't have done it without, uh, you know, the input and, you know, honestly, the approval of stakeholders, whether that's the commission, whether that's our, our, our vendors, our, you know, various interveners. Um, it was amazing to see how quickly we were able to come together and and really make positive change. And I um, I intend to to continue to kind of push those and and you know assume that that's the new normal is that great rapid collaboration. Um, and then the last one, just building on what Becca said around um, you know our, our our income qualified customers and whether it's on the residential side or whether it's the the businesses. You know we um, headquartered in Minneapolis. We had uh, some very direct and frankly scary and, and eye-opening um, examples of, of some of the inequities that, um, that we talked about. And, you know, we need to better understand and really not just, you know, be equitable on our side, but really push the envelope and figure out how we can use this as a tool to, you know, help those customers and businesses that are impacted, whether from COVID, whether from social inequities, and you know, really close that gap. Um, and, you know, we, we again have some great support from stakeholders on that, um, but it, it's going to challenge us to kind of look at our programs a little differently and, and what can we do and whether that's some of the, the uh, 
you know, the, the workforce development or the training and certification we talked about before, or even, you know, more direct involvement. Um, we have some exciting opportunities there. So those those are more to come. And I, I won't say that that's going to continue the what we've been doing, but really it's going to evolve and, and take us further. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Charles, over to you. Yeah, so I want to start with a broad comment. What has to happen to sustain it is what you both here together, Carol, which is different people from different interests, perspectives, kind of collaborating and thinking through things together. I've been in the industry 30 years and um, it never ceases to amaze me when I sit on panels like this, either virtual or in person, how all the panelists tend to be coalescing around similar themes. So I'm not gonna say anything different than Emily or Mark or Rebecca hasn't said, but I do wanna connect some dots. I think one of the things that's gonna have to happen because Becca mentioned this and Mark mentioned this, and I think sometimes we tend to is an industry forget when we segment our customers we tend to think of residential industrial commercial but even within the um, residentials there's two classes of customers there's owners and there's renters let's not even talk about income and when we think about a lot of the big gains that can be made for energy efficiency renters are not going to be able to take advantage of it because it's not their property um, and we have to figure out how do we allow renters to take advantage of some of the, the bigger bang for the buck improvements where the landlord doesn't keep all the benefits and the renter doesn't receive any of the benefits of it and, and that tends to be a problem particularly because regulators don't have any statutory authority over landlords it has statutory authority over utilities and so even if the utilities do some of these um, programs if the landlords get all of the energy savings but don't pass the savings in terms of rent reductions to people who have income challenges, we still perpetuate inequities. So that's gonna be a big leap. Um, I was in the mid-Atlantic when Hurricane Isabel came through and we had a lot of devastation. We hired an external consultant. And one of the main learnings um, that he taught the utility is that hurricanes or power outages are not utility events, they're community events. And we had to bring the entire community, various stakeholders, as Mark said, and Becca and Emily said before together, and I think we're going to have to do that around energy efficiency. We're going to have to demonstrate that we can spend money on energy efficiency, reduce inefficient power plants. And some people are going to argue, but yeah, those people are to work, but then we can repurpose them and we can repurpose other people who may not have gone to college to train them how to do inspections, how to install things so that they can have jobs, keep the economic engines of the region flowing. But it can't just be one organization or two organizations. It has to be a holistic view. And I think if we can get to a holistic view and solve holistic problems, we can continue to advance energy efficiency because we're not doing it just so we're energy efficient. We're doing it for a purpose. We're doing it so that we can reduce bills. We can clean the environment. We can help facilitate jobs. And if we can, as a, as a, as a community of interest, get people to understand that, I think we have a long way to go and a lot more gains to get when it comes to energy efficiency. Thank you, Charles. Agree with all of that. And Emily, I'm going to turn it over to you in our last uh, couple of minutes here. I'm going to also put up the contact slide as you're speaking. Thank you. Sure, just a couple of, of final thoughts building on what the other panelists have shared. One, we heard a lot about the importance of supporting lower income and vulnerable customers um, and how um, Excel and Austin Energy and Rhode Island are working on that. I would just note that we're at a particularly fraught time in this pandemic with unemployment benefits having run out for folks and a lot of utilities have paused shutdowns and it and disconnects and at some point soon those may resume. So I think um, an immediate thing that, that we're certainly interested in helping utilities and, and states to work on is connecting the dots between arrearage management programs and low-income services and low-income rates, fuel assistance, and energy efficiency to provide long-term support. It's gonna be just extremely important to make those connections at this time as the number of vulnerable customers potentially and unfortunately could be um, skyrocketing rapidly. And then I, a, a last thought, I'm one of the things that I'm excited about coming out of COVID is the, the way it's helping us to broaden the lens and connect the dots with health and helping people think about a broader perspective on energy efficiency as an economic development and job creation engine um, and potentially enabling 
regulators and partners and program administrators to have a bit more flexibility in looking at how energy efficiency can be a key part of a broad-based solution. And that might involve having the programs be a little bit more expensive from a cost to achieve perspective as we provide services that are you know, of direct benefit to people, but they're still gonna be really cost effective. They're still gonna provide efficiency as a grid resource, and they're gonna continue to provide and increasingly provide this myriad um, and, um, and wealth of broader community and health benefits. So that's really exciting to see and something I hope we hang on to. Thank you, Emily, and I see everybody nodding. I think we've connected quite a lot of dots today, and I really want to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion and making my job so easy. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for, for joining us today. Uh, we'll be posting this video on our website, uh, and it, uh, everyone's contact information is listed on the screen. If you have any uh, questions, please feel free to contact us, and keep in mind the other clean energy calls that, uh, that will be coming along. And, I hope you all have a really wonderful rest of your day and week, and thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.